If Americans are trying every possible way to eliminate more than 9 million wild boars, then on the other side of the globe, another country is cutting its entire continent in half to build thousands of kilometers of fences, not to stop people, but to block invasive species. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Deep in Australia's harsh outback, workers erected countless wires and mesh across barren land to keep out millions of dangerous invaders. Many critics called the project an outrageous waste, yet 10 years later, the results shocked the whole world. So how did they manage to make these fences not only protect livestock and crops, but also kickstart one of the most unexpected ecological reversals in modern history? Right now, TerranWorks will take you on a journey to discover how Australians quietly pulled off a global conservation feat. You may have heard of the Great Wall of China, but few people know that Australia once built a Great Wall of its own. Everything began on Christmas Day in 1859, in what seemed like a harmless act, when breeder Thomas Austin released 24 European rabbits for weekend sport. But by 1880, their descendants were advancing 60 kilometers per year, stripping pastures down to bare sand and reducing wool production across Victoria and South Australia. Australia tried everything, poison, traps, bounties for killing rabbits, even explosive engines to scare them off. But all of it was too slow. The press called this invasion the Grey Plague and begged the government to take action. In desperation, Western Australia responded with a bold idea. Build a steel wall thousands of kilometers long to stop the rabbits. In 1897, surveyors drove stakes marking a wire line near the Zedorb Cliffs. Within 10 years, it had grown into a state barrier 1,260 kilometers long, made of three strands of galvanized mesh buried 30 centimeters deep and cleared five meters on each side to prevent rodents from taking cover. The fence was built so solidly, with wires straight as a tennis net, that people joked if rabbits could play tennis, they'd probably serve right over it. Fence patrolmen riding camels were paid in flour, tea, and tobacco to walk 30 kilometers twice a week, patching holes with hand-forged staples under 45 degrees Celsius heat. Results were still mixed. Rabbits continued slipping through joints, but farmers noticed side benefits. Pigs, emus, and wild dogs had a harder time getting across, giving fragile wheat shoots room to breathe. Fence-building culture took root quickly. By 1905, the rabbit-proof fence system had spread across Queensland, bringing with it countless expensive yet hopeful inventions, and districts had to tax livestock owners to expand the wire network. Science finally turned the tide in 1950, when the myxomatosis virus escaped the laboratory and wiped out 90% of the rabbits. Parliament debated dismantling the fences, but wool councils objected. Predators had become accustomed to patrolling along the fence lines, and removing them could allow a single bad season to swallow an entire year's profit. A structure originally built to stop a pest had now become an essential link in the wool industry, which at the time accounted for half of Australia's foreign income. This chapter left two ironclad lessons. Invasive species always spread faster than any public works project can respond. And once a fence becomes ingrained in a farm's economics, removing it can be more costly than building it. Calculating the pasture saved and the wool price shocks avoided, economists estimated the fence delivered $5 billion in benefits, 10 times the accumulated maintenance costs. This figure silenced most critics, but some historians warned of social costs never accounted for. The lands of the Niaju and Wangath peoples were divided without consent, breaking song lines and water flows. But all those efforts were only the beginning, because the real enemy that forced Australia to build the largest defensive structure in its history wasn't the rabbit, but the dingo. If rabbits devastated Australian agriculture, 
Dingoes gnawed at the heart of the livestock industry. A single pack of dingoes can kill dozens of sheep in one night. Pressure from the livestock sector pushed Australian politicians to choose the most familiar solution, build more fences to confine all dingoes to the north and west of sheep grazing regions. The survey team began in 1914 at Jimbor, Queensland, heading southwest, driving wooden stakes along compass bearings and ignoring rivers entirely. By 1958, the dingo fence had become a 5,614 kilometers long man-made structure, longer than the distance from London to New York and enough to wrap around Spain twice. Built from barbed wire and 1.8 meter high steel mesh, it formed a steel horizon across the red center of the continent. Construction was brutally difficult. Workers drilled under 45 degrees heat, slept beside wires so hot they could fry eggs, and were paid only two pounds per mile, causing many to quit. Those who stayed had to improvise using rail sleepers where rocks made digging impossible or weaving branch mats when floods threatened. Today, 21 fence patrollers in diesel pickups each monitor an average stretch of 300 kilometers. Every vehicle carries 50 kilograms of replacement mesh, 14 steel posts, couplers, and a tire repair kit. Satellite phones connect them to the control center in Broken Hill, where pressure sensors alert operators whenever a wire snaps. In summer, they bring 50 liters of water and crates of frozen oranges. As of 2025, annual maintenance costs are around $10 million, funded partly by a levy of 10 cents per shorn sheep. Ranchers complain but admit that a single breach can erase profits faster than a drought. One winter night three years ago, a pack of dingoes killed 59 sheep in four hours near Hungerford. The rancher found the carcasses stacked like firewood under a mulga tree. A silent audit of the price of a loose steel clip. This great fence crosses rivers, cuts through deserts, and passes over the lands of 23 indigenous language nations. For indigenous peoples, it is not just a fence. It is a scar slicing through ancestral song lines, dividing water flows and sacred spaces thousands of years old. And more importantly, the disappearance of dingoes triggered a new disaster. Removing an apex predator destabilized the entire food web, and the ecological consequences are what truly shocked the world. When dingoes were removed from the east, the kangaroo population their natural prey skyrocketed to around 45 million, nearly double Australia's current human population. Many people think kangaroos are cute and gentle animals until they see a towering, muscular one boxing with a human or locking a hunting dog in a chokehold in the middle of a field. A mature male can reach two meters tall, weigh over 90 kilograms, and deliver kicks stronger than 800 PSI, enough to break the bones of an adult man. Kangaroos are perhaps one of the world's most unusual species, because few animals are both the symbol of an entire nation and at the same time legally hunted and processed on the very land they represent. But everything has its reasons. With their population spread widely, they move in herds, eat voraciously, and are active at night. Kangaroos compete with livestock for food, break fences, trample crops, and cause damage amounting to billions of dollars. Some indigenous communities fiercely oppose kangaroo hunting, viewing them as sacred beings tied to Mother Earth. But ecologists warn that when an ecosystem falls out of its natural balance, sometimes a controversial measure is the least harmful option. Therefore, to maintain grassland balance, about 1.5 to 2 million kangaroos are harvested each year under controlled hunting. 
creating a meat and leather industry worth over $150 million. Kangaroos have become the clearest evidence of the consequences of removing dingoes, and they open a new chapter in Australia's fence wars. Australia's ecosystem is like an intricate spiderweb. If one strand moves, every other strand trembles. The removal of dingoes caused grasslands to disappear, soils to lose carbon, and red dust to blow all the way to Sydney. Insects, birds, soil fungi, and shrubs all changed in structure. Many scientists describe the dingo fence as the dividing line between two worlds. One side kept in balance by dingoes, the other eroded from the roots up. Today, the dingo fence does not rely solely on human labor. Ranchers use infrared drones, vibration sensors, and motion-triggered lights. Maintenance work drains both body and spirit. Patrollers live three weeks in isolation. Companies provide mental health checkups via satellite and beach holidays to keep them from quitting. Banks and insurance firms assess risk based on maps of fence breaches, affecting land value and interest rates. Yet ultraviolet light, night dew, termites, and flash floods, all are enemies that weaken the fence. By 2024, auditors declared that 1,000 kilometers of the fence had fatigued and was at risk of failure within five years. NSW allocated $25 million for reconstruction, using composite posts recycled from milk bottles and solar-powered automatic gates. Ultimately, how a fence is viewed always depends on each party's position and interests. The same structure can protect farmers' livelihoods, yet also divide land and sever ancient cultural memories. The debate between prioritizing livestock or restoring nature has therefore never reached a conclusion. In council meetings, People evaluate everything from individual screws to alternative solutions like guardian dogs. And data shows that in some places, these dogs can reduce attacks by up to 70%. But these debates are only the surface. The impacts of fences are far deeper. Genetic studies in China show that trees on both sides of the Great Wall exhibit signs of inbreeding after more than 2,000 years, a warning for all habitat-fragmenting structures. In Australia, kangaroos east of the fence have changed bone structures over time. And if the fence were suddenly removed, these individuals might not survive the return of dingoes. These consequences are not unique to Australia. Botswana once built veterinary fences that caused mass die-offs of antelope when migration routes were blocked. Canada has a fence density 16 times higher than its paved roads, obstructing the movements of pronghorn. In Europe, fences built to stop African swine fever have become ghost walls, trapping deer and lynx. The common lesson, fences erected for temporary crises often last for decades and leave ecological legacies that cannot be undone. That is why delegations from Namibia, Mongolia, and Arizona have come to Australia to learn how to design, maintain, and modernize fences. But Australia's deepest lesson lies in the opposite direction. It's not only about building fences, but knowing when to take them down. In 2004, Botswana removed part of the Naipan fence, and after just three years, zebra herds restored their 600 kilometers migration route bringing water, grass, and tourism back to the drylands. Therefore, Australia is reassessing its entire fence system. A 2025 proposal suggests shifting 50 kilometers of the dingo fence northward, combined with guardian dogs and sensors to protect key sheep grazing regions. Trials show that removing just one kilometers of fence allows vegetation to recover, lizard populations to rise, and soil conditions to improve within three seasons. The risk is $65 million in annual losses from dingo attacks. But the benefit is saving $80 million in long-term maintenance. New technologies, footstep detecting fiber optics, drones dropping harmless pepper balls, are opening the door to a more flexible, smarter digital fence. Yet that future remains uncertain.
And so the big question returns, is Australia's vast fence system ultimately protecting or harming the very ecosystem it was created to preserve? How do you see this story and what do you think is a viable solution? Leave a comment and don't forget to follow us to continue exploring the places where people and nature collide.